Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org. This week on NJ Business Beat, all eyes on the budget. Business advocates testify about the changes they want to see to the governor's $49 billion spending plan. Plus, international impact in New Jersey. We talk to a banking expert about how global events are driving up costs in our state. And we put the business behind the arts in focus, highlighting how New Jersey's creative minds turn art into thriving businesses, including in the digital market and blockchain. That's straight ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. New Jerseyans this week got a chance to have their say on the nearly $49 billion budget proposed by Governor Phil Murphy for the next fiscal year. The Assembly Budget Committee held its first public hearings on the budget, hearing from representatives from the business community and nonprofits who are seeking their share of funding. One hot topic was the need to support the child care industry in the state, which was described as being in crisis due to staffing and other challenges. Meantime, the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce's Mike Eginton pushed state lawmakers to approve a bill to use federal funds to replenish the state's unemployment insurance trust fund rather than requiring businesses to spend money to do so. We recognize and appreciate that there's been recent movement of legislation to replenish the state's unemployment insurance fund. We respectfully ask that the state legislature follow the lead of 30 other states, enact that legislation as part of the budget process, and fully replenish the UI fund. To not alleviate the issue would create a tax increase adding to the business community's pandemic-related burdens. The business community has other concerns about the proposed budget. A recent survey of its members by the New Jersey Society of CPAs found nearly 55 percent believe the governor's budget will leave the state's economy either marginally worse or significantly worse over the longer term. 24 percent said it would stay the same and 22 percent thought the economy would improve. This week, the Biden administration announced new sanctions on Russia, hoping to put more economic pressure on the country as it continues its assault on Ukraine. The war has created some uncertainty and added costs for New Jersey's businesses. I spoke about that with Christopher Marr, chairman and CEO of Ocean First Bank. Nice to see you back on NJ Business Beat. Good to see you, Rhonda. So business, as we know, are always dealing with uncertainties, but it seems that this is a more trying time than we've seen previously. Costs are rising, and now we have this war in the Ukraine, which is also very unsettling. What are you hearing among your commercial clients in New Jersey? Well, obviously, you know, our clients are concerned for the people of the Ukraine, concerned about the situation and the, the broader humanitarian crisis. Uh, but it's also, you know, making things a little more difficult in terms of supply chains as well as uh, inflation and the, the price of goods going up. So it's both the certainty about being able to get what you need to do your business and then the cost to do that. Uh, and this is all on top of the uh, tremendous pressure they've been feeling over labor in the last uh, years. 
So how are these uncertainties impacting their daily business decisions and their thoughts on expansion and continued investment in their businesses? Well, fortunately, the economy remains quite strong, especially in New Jersey. So in the short term, we're not seeing any change in the decision making our clients are, are taking on in terms of investments into new businesses, into plants and equipment, into facilities, and, and even their desire to expand their employment. So, so far, while they're concerned, it has not changed buying habits. And we're seeing that across the economy. What about the issue of supply chain disruptions? I mean, if it's not what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, there's also a situation in China where key cities have been locked down on renewed COVID concerns. Is there any thought process behind sourcing supply chains differently now? Many of our clients have gone, have gone through their procurement operations to make sure that they're not regionally tied to any one player, that they have multiple sources of supply for any particular critical items. And this is a much more complex problem than we had, say, a year or so ago in, in something like lumber. Um, you know, lumber or a commodities issue can be addressed pretty quickly. Uh, you get more capacity on board, you can bring the prices down. When you're dealing with these lingering issues over, uh, you know, things like microchips, but also, you know, say wiring harnesses. There are some um, automotive plants in Western Ukraine that produce wiring harnesses for a lot of different auto manufacturers. And if you, if you can't wire the car, uh, you can't put it together. So th this is a compounding issue. Could some of these issues actually benefit the warehouse economy in New Jersey? There's no question. We've already seen the demand for warehouse increasing. So, you know, the, the idea of just-in-time manufacturing, which was in vogue, uh, people are rethinking that in certain sectors because you can't count on the goods being delivered in such a timely way. So we're seeing it in warehousing. We're seeing a, a big boom in, um, in medical space as well, uh, both research and development space as well as production space, cold storage, things like that. So good to talk to you once again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rhonda. Good to see you. There's a wave of business owners nearing retirement, and Rutgers University says the coming silver tsunami puts tens of thousands of businesses and millions of jobs at risk. So the NJNY Center of Employee Ownership at Rutgers has rolled out a free online program to guide owners through the process of selling their businesses to employees through an employee stock ownership plan or worker cooperative. The program targets business owners of color, Research shows most of those owners do not have a succession plan. I spoke with the center's executive director, Professor Bill Castellano, to learn more. Professor, the Center for Employee Ownership attempts to solve a very big problem among people of color who own businesses. First, let's tackle the problem. What is going on where we're not seeing the kind of succession plan that you see in other businesses? Um, I think nearly 50% of people of color who own businesses are also nearing retirement, but yet, to your point, only a third have viable business succession plans in place. And they are looking for options to you know, preserve the wealth that they've built up over the years. And um, it's a problem that is, um, I think, having a greater impact on people of color than um, non-people of color businesses. And of course, the pandemic has exacerbated problems among business owners in minority communities. So I guess you pile that on top of things uh, and you have an even bigger problem. Exactly. Uh, I think people of color, business owners had harder time accessing capital to, to keep their businesses afloat. Um, but yet businesses that were employee owned um, weathered that storm um, much better than non-employee owned firms, which is why this is a, a strategy that we're highly recommending business owners of color to think about. And what sort of successes have we seen among businesses that do sell to their employees? The research is pretty clear that um, employee owned firms do extremely well. They have much higher survivability rates, particularly during the COVID um, crisis. They had much fewer layoffs, much fewer reductions in um, pay or hours of work. Um, overall, um, you see much higher levels of employee engagement. I mean, when you share ownership with employees, um, they act like owners, they think like owners. 
They help the business succeed. And clearly we see all of those benefits across the board when we look at employee-owned firms compared to non-employee-owned firms. Well, Professor, tell me as well when people can actually access the programs. Are they up now live in terms of the education modules? Yes, all of the um, free um, online educational resources are on our website um, at the School of Management and Labor Relationships. Um, we're, we're also at ownership.brothers.edu. And if you access that website, you'll have um, the ability to register for the program. There's two tracks. There's a track uh, providing information on creating a worker cooperative, and there's a track providing information on creating an ESOP, you know, two strategies for successfully, you know, selling your businesses to employees. Well, great. It's been wonderful to hear about this, and thanks for your time today. Thank you. My pleasure. As COVID concerns recede, New Jerseyans are out and about venturing around the state and arts and culture organizations are putting in-person performances and events back on their calendars. While the pandemic created big financial challenges for arts groups, it also led to new ideas and artistic expression. We're putting the business of the arts in focus this week. Economic activity from the arts and culture accounts for 4% of U.S. GDP, or $877 billion, according to the most recent figures from the federal government. During the first year of the pandemic in 2020, that activity declined sharply. The total economic value of the business of the arts in New Jersey that year was close to $21 billion, or 3.4% of the state's GDP. More than 119,000 New Jerseyans work in the arts, earning a collective $11.7 billion. Now, if that sounds like a lot, it's because the government's stats include a wide range of jobs in its arts and culture categories, such as performing arts, people working as writers, artists, performers, agents and promoters, and at arts companies, design services, people working in advertising, graphic design, and even architecture, along with education. What stats and numbers cannot measure is the intrinsic value of art and performance. That value is well understood by Felicia Swoop, who was recently named Executive Director of Newark Arts. Swoop's background is broad. She's worked as an artist, a curator, and a teacher. I spoke with her about her hopes for Newark Arts, an organization with this motto, powering the arts to transform lives. Felicia, thanks for joining me on NJ Business Beat. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. You are fairly new to Newark Arts. What attracted you to the organization? Well, I first came to Newark in 2011 for the Alvin Ailey Dance Foundation as the director of the first Ailey Camp Newark and completely fell in love with the city and the children. We housed 100 middle schoolers at Arts High for about six weeks for Ailey Camp Newark. And it honestly was one of the greatest experiences of my life. The children completely surprised us after six weeks of intense study in dance and visual arts and drumming. And they performed at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center at the end of that camp session. And their parents were completely blown away. We were blown away. These children were not professional dancers and they performed as if their life depended on it. And they completely left blood on the dance floor. And that's what got me excited about Newark is seeing the arts in Newark through the eyes of the children. That is such an amazing and inspiring story. How do you take that experience and replicate the vibrancy of what you saw on the stage for other organizations in Newark? So that was my introduction to Newark and showing me how deeply the talent runs in this city and that it has been traditionally unresourced, but there are so many resources now. Newark Art serves as one of those resources through our partners such as Prudential and PSENG and Victoria and Dodge Foundations. These are the foundations that are rooted in Newark that help organizations like mine, a small nonprofit, to serve artists of every age. And at Newark Arts, we're interested 
in the children who are budding artists and the established artists. And so it's really exciting to be here at this time in a city where the mayor himself is an artist and completely supports the arts through the Creative Catalyst Fund and so many different, different initiatives. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been able to engage with the mayor and so many different stakeholders and the passion behind the, the fundraising and the donors here is like nothing I've ever seen. They're fully invested in the community in the children and again, artists of all ages. How do you think other organizations can learn about what's happening in Newark and try to take that home with them? Um, we always hear that arts in general needs more funding. So how does the message get out there that arts organizations are worth funding and there is a return on the investment? There's so many different ways, and that's part of the reason why Newark Arts exists, is to make sure that funders, corporations, private donors, and anyone who is just a regular citizen knows just how important the arts are to drive the economy. Americans for the Arts conducted the Prosperity Five report that in, re, re, relayed to us that the arts have driven the economy by $178.3 million. And that's something that artists don't really think about and probably corporations don't think about is that if you invest in the artists, they will drive business. They will drive business into the city. They will be ambassadors outside of the city to draw more people in. We really are an opportunity for the city to grow and to drive economic development here. Felicia, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. While many dream of pursuing their artistic passions on a full-time basis, it's a big step to take and one not without financial risk. We talked to one artist, Jack Florzik, who decided to make the jump. Born and raised in Teaneck, this contemporary fine artist is putting paintbrush to canvas while also turning his artwork into digital assets, selling his art as NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Jack, nice to talk to you on NJ Business Beat. I am impressed with your artwork. What's it like being an artist these days and trying to advance your career? Yeah, so it's a lot of fun. I, I love it. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Uh, but it's definitely tough. Uh, you have to, uh, originally before I, uh, you know, fully launched into being a full-time professional artist, I didn't realize that it's basically running a business, a, a company uh, built on my artwork. So there's lots of promotion involved and social media has been great, but you also can't let that distract it. You know, you have to come into the studio every every day, ready to paint, ready to create artwork, um, and just you know, trying to keep your mind right, trying to stay inspired on a daily basis is a challenge, but it's the challenge that I love. One avenue for you lately is venturing into NFTs and having your artwork uh, purchased and shown in a different way. Why did you decide to consider adding NFTs as part of your business? I think it's important as an artist to experiment and to also, you know, evolve with the times. Uh, so at first I just wanted to experiment with this new medium and see what was happening. And then all of a sudden it really started to, to blow up. And I felt that I had to, I had a lot to contribute. So I started creating multiple forms of, of NFTs, some that are just, you know, images of my artwork, some that are created uh, purely digital, um, and then some that are more of a collectible than they are artwork. And have you been able to make money using the NFTs? Pieces don't sell for the same amount that, you know, an original painting of mine might sell, uh, but... They're, they're selling slowly, but they're, they're moving along uh, in, in a good direction for the vision that I have. Uh, because I, at, at this stage, I mostly see it as establishing a digital infrastructure for my business, where 
I can give people a, a, a cheaper, more affordable entry point into my artwork that might allow them to interact with me in the digital world 10 years from now in a way that you know, might otherwise have uh, not been possible. I mean, it's interesting because it's early days with the NFTs, but this point you make about giving people an entry into the art world for a lower price, I mean, could this be a huge boost for the art industry, do you think, as somebody that's trying to navigate your way through it? There's so much that can happen with NFTs. There's so much that, that you can do by, uh, one, giving back to your collectors in, in a unique way of, uh, you know, when someone, when people purchase your NFTs, you know exactly the holders of those particular pieces. So you can instantly uh, send them new artwork. You can offer rewards to collectors that hold your, your artwork. So you can, you can include them into your kind of creative process in that way. Uh, but it also allows for artists and, and companies and brands to create something more than just the art that they're creating. Well, it's been great getting to uh, know you a little bit and your artwork. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. New Jersey's arts community thrives in part due to Art Pride, which is the state's largest arts service and advocacy organization. The group works to secure funding and advance policies that invest in arts across all sectors. That's needed now more than ever. While shows and performances are back, attendance is still lagging. And while COVID cases have declined significantly, we don't know if and when cases may start rising again. We spoke with Art Pride's Director of Advocacy and Public Policy, Anne-Marie Miller, about those issues. Anne-Marie, I always love spring because it feels like the art scene in New Jersey really comes to life. Are we seeing a normal spring for the arts in New Jersey, or is there still a bit of a pandemic hangover, if you will? Um, um, yes, there is a bit of a pandemic hangover. Uh, what I'm hearing, um, the State Arts Council did a survey, um, informal survey of, of arts organizations around the state about 10 days ago, maybe two weeks, and they were reporting that attendance on average is about 44% of capacity. So that's obvious. That's a very tough figure to work with for arts organizations. Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. It's um, difficult, uh, unpredictable, uh, depending upon the news sometimes, um, and, um, and just people being comfortable going back uh, into a, a setting where there are, you know, hundreds and, or thousands of people. Continue. Are you worried that arts organizations in New Jersey are going to fail this year because of a lack of resources, the lack of attendance? Are they going to fail? Um, I think groups will try to stay open as much as they possibly can. I think if the pandemic, you know, stays at a subsided level, um, you know, and, and uh, attendance increases, that will help. Um, what I think really is the, the biggest driving factor right now is just the unpredictability of the future. Um, will they have to go through this again? Um, when the cold winter months come, uh, you know, will there be a lack of revenue? There's no sustainability, dependability. That, that fluctuation is what everybody's trying to prepare for now, uh, which is why recovery funds are so important. What has been one of the biggest successes or success for arts organizations this past year? Putting the money aside, were they able to perhaps pivot in their offerings, move virtually? Or how would you describe the biggest success? Yeah, I think you nailed it. I mean, everybody pivoted, but the creative um, sector, I think, was really, you know, to be redundant, creative. Um, there were uh, so many virtual offerings um, provided by so many different arts organizations. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, there were also take home activities that um, museums provided when parents went to, uh, you know, pick up school lunches, they would pick up something for their children to do at the same time. Um, there was, you know, I think arts, and entertainment value was uh, essential to mental health 
of all of us as we were going through um, isolation during the pandemic. So the virtual offerings played a huge role and um, many arts groups were able to reach larger audiences outside of their local um, audiences through through virtual performances and virtual offerings. And I think they're gonna continue to try to do that, but that's also demanding in terms of resources, um, technical resources, equipment, um, you know, adapting to that, that setting. Well, it's been nice hearing uh, where things stand and I hope the future continues to brighten for arts organizations around the state. Thanks for your work. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to lend a few words. And that wraps up our show for this week. Thank you for watching NJ Business Beat. I'm Rhonda Schapler. You enjoy your weekend. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102 lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org.